died in Ephesus. So it was a famous city, a famous church, guys, okay? And just like, um, just like the church of Ephesus was, was famous and big and large, so was Smyrna, guys. And I'm going to give you a little bit of, of history uh, about the church of Smyrna. But before I do, we're going to just jump in and let's read a little bit of the church or the letter that was written to the church of Smyrna, okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and it says in this form, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say there are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be heard by the second death. Amen. Now, there's so much information here. I pray that I can be able to give it to you the way I feel the, the Lord has been speaking to me about, about this message. Because not only are we going to talk history, but there is a message here for the church, guys. There's a message. The same way we saw in the church of Ephesus that God is looking more than the mechanics, but he's looking at the motives, at the heart. There is a, there's a message here for the church of Smyrna. But as I mentioned in the beginning, that Ephesus was a famous uh, and large city, guys, but so was Smyrna. Smyrna was large, beautiful, and a proud city. They claimed to be the glory of Asia. They were a trading uh, city, uh, specifically wine, guys. They traded a lot of wine. And for that reason, they were a very rich city, guys. Okay? They were a rich city. Uh, they were also committed deeply to idolatry. Uh, there was a famous street in Smyrna called the uh, Golden Street. And in that street, guys, they created a lot of temples, guys, okay? This is where we have Ephrodites. They had the, the temple of Ephrodite, uh, Apollos, uh, Zeus. Uh, this is where they had temples built for these gods, and they worshiped these gods. So they were very uh, people of idolatry. Uh, but as time went on, check this out, guys. As time went on, and I want to give you a little bit of history because I want to take you into the letter, the context or the, the setting of where this letter hit Smyrna. So some time passed, and the worship of these gods, uh, these Greek gods, kind of vanished, guys, okay? And on 196 B.C., guys, um, Smyrna was the first city to build a temple to what is known Dia Roma. This is the goddess of Rome. Okay, this is the goddess of Rome. It's a spiritual symbol of the Roman Empire, Dia Roma. Okay, so with that idol that was pushed out, they started to worship now all the old imperials. Okay, that was the first reason they built this temple. They made this the aroma so that they can worship all the previous um, imp emperors that were in Rome. Uh, but then they took it to another step, and they started to worship then the present imperials, okay? And I say another step because I want you to understand this is how the enemy works, guys. He works through steps, okay? The enemy never comes in full bloom to come and destroy someone or to create some kind of fear or to create some kind of strategy. There are steps that are taken. Amen? So, again, uh, Smyrna builds the aroma, and they start by worshiping all the uh, deceased emperors. Time passes. Then they say, hey, let's start worshiping now the present emperors, okay? And they were the first. So, check it out. Out of 11 cities, guys, they were the ones who built... Um, the first temple, guys, directed to, and I want to give you his name. I think it's Tiberius. Tiberius, let me see where I'm at. Ty, 
Tiberius Caesar. There, Smyrna was the city. Out of 11 cities, Smyrna was the city who built the temple to Ti Tiberius Caesar, guys, to worship the present Caesar that was in, in an office. Um, time passes, guys. Check this out. And I'm almost done with this little bit of history that I want to give you. Time passes, and now we're in 8196, and another Roman emperor comes by the name of uh, Domit Domitian, okay? Now, when this man came into place, guys, he is the emperor that started saying that he started forcing. It, it was no longer going to be something optional or something that I'm creating a temple, and it's your free will to either worship this or not. It was never pushed on anyone. It was just something that they created. And again, step by step, we're going to worship or we're going to mem uh, create a memory for, for those that have deceased emperors. And then we get the present, but it's still not forceful. When this emperor came into play, now he starts making a, a, a command, a decree uh, that he, he needs to be called Lord. Okay, They want uh, forceful worship to him. And, and, and from there, we start to hear and more emperors that come in who also push in, um, you know, this, this command that they needed to be worshipped. The emperors needed to be worshipped. And this is kind of where Smyrna comes into place with this letter, guys, because now they're commanding everyone to worship the emperor. Um, there was something that also this emperor, what they would do, or some of the things... One of the things that he wanted everyone to do was that once a year, guys, once a year, they needed to get some, um, um, what do you call it, the offering, not offering, let me, let me see where I'm at, hold on, where am I at here, give me a little break, okay, once a year they had to do, to burn a pinch of incense, guys, just a pinch of incense, on the altar of the Godhead of Caesar. Uh, after that, they can go and do whatever they wanted to do. So once a year, a pinch of incense. They, they'll go to the place where the, where the altar was of the statue and a pinch of incense and burn it. And, and then they can go and do whatever they wanted to do and worship whoever they wanted to do. And again, this is the setting of where this letter comes to be. So we know as Christians, guys, so when we talk about burning an incense and, and, and dedicating it to this God or whatever, what, what they want is they, they, they want it for the Christians to actually say that, you know, he is Lord. You know, that's, that's the action behind the pinch of the incense and burning on the altar because they, want, they wanted the Christians to say, hey, we recognize that he is also a God and, and we honor him in this way. That was the whole idea. But you and I know that Christians don't, don't acknowledge no other God but the God of the heavens, right? That's just the way it is. As Christians, guys, as Christians, we don't bow down to anyone else but God, okay? And we see that throughout Scripture, guys. We see that with Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego, right? We see that they didn't bow down to the statue that was presented. No matter what came to, you know, to... Uh, uh, for their consequences. They, they didn't bow down. So this is a principle. And this is where we see, guys, that uh, this letter comes to Smyrna. So real quick, I'm not going to do the introduction just yet because there is an introduction to what we read, right? Jesus said that he is the first and the last, the one who was dead and resurrected. That's the introduction. And I'm going to save that for in a little while. That's the introduction. But then he says, I know your works. The same way he did with Ephesus. I know your works. So God is the one who sees all things, guys, Okay. And he says, I know your works. And he goes, I know your tribulation. So, again, that's the first thing that I want you to notice, guys, that whenever they didn't bow down to this God, whenever they didn't burn the incense and declare that Caesar was Lord, tribulation came their way, guys. Okay? Tribulation took place. He says, I see your works. I know your work. I'm seeing I'm seeing what's happening. I know that you're trying and you're working hard to stand up for me. I know your works. Tribulation has come. This tribulation comes to them in a form of poverty, guys. He goes, I know your works. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. I see your poorness. So remember, guys, this city is a rich city. So why are the Christians poor? 
Well, that's part of the tribulation. In Smyrna, guys, whenever this was taking place, they started to fire Christians. They started to fire the Christians because they would not bow down to Caesar. They started to uh, uh, fire Christians. They would not hire Christians. So therefore, the Christians suffered financially, guys.
testing. There you go. The church of Laodicea, the last church, that, that passage of scripture says that they, they were rich. They were rich. They had everything going on. But God says that they were poor. It's not about the external, guys. It's about the internal. You don't have to have nothing but Jesus, and you're good. <laughs> Victory Outreach, right? I always remember Victory Outreach, and, and the reason I know is because uh, one of my, my good friends that I hadn't seen in a very long time, but he was there, and he used to say when they were going to bus to the temple, he would say, you know, there was, they would chant, you know, they would sing and chant, and they would say, Beans and rice in Jesus Christ. You know, because that's all they had. They didn't have too much. But they were happy. They were full of joy. They were full of power. Because it's not the external that makes us happy, guys. And that, it's not the external that, that says that we're blessed. It's the internal. There's a lot of people with a lot of stuff and still live miserable. They have a lot of money in the bank. They have a lot of this and a lot of that. And still, they're ugly. It's messed up. Their life is messed up. I just need Jesus. And that's what we're seeing here, guys. Jesus. So check this out. Before I give you this PowerPoint of, of problems, I want to I sh share with you this. Because when we look at, at the church of Laodicea that I said that they claim to be rich, these people perhaps, were they had money. And they can help people out when it came to maybe food or maybe even paying somebody's doctor bill. They had the money to do that, guys. Uh, the Church of Smyrna didn't have that, but they did have the power of God. When I started to think, because they were rich, they were rich. When I started to think about that, I started to think about what happened on Acts chapter 3 with Peter, guys. I don't know if y'all remember the story, but Peter... We're going, Peter and, and I believe it's uh, John, they were going into the temple, guys, and there was a, pa a paralytic man that was there, and he was asking for alms. And look at what he says, guys. This is found on Acts chapter 3, verse 6. After the man asked for money, he says, this is what Peter says. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Like, I don't have money. I'm broke just like you probably. But let me tell you, I got something inside of me that can really help you and bless your life, guys. You hear what I'm saying? This is, this church, hey, now I'm not against prosperity against. I'm not against that. I'm not against any money. The only thing I'm against is that money have you. If the money has you, then you're in a big problem, guys. You hear? You can have both. But let me tell you something. I rather choose the power of God. Then the prosperity of this world, guys. You hear what I'm saying? That, that was this church, man. They were powerful. And, and there's the purpose. So I call this the purpose of the problem number one. I want to give you just a nugget here, a PowerPoint, the purpose of the problem. The reason why problems sometimes come, guys, into our life, like we see in Smyrna, is so that we can see the power of God at work. Because when you're at wit's sin and nothing else works, who do you turn to? And then what happens? Power. 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 You know, guys, we in America, we're chiflados. And, you know, and I find myself feeling kind of, well, I'm not going to go there just yet. But we have everything here. We have doctors. We have medication. We have, there's other places that don't have Money, don't have doctors, don't have anything. And they see miracles take place. They see the power of God take place. And that's what I'm talking. When problems come and poverty comes at times, comes, man, we're able to see the power of God at work, guys. And that's what we're seeing here, guys. They were poor, but yet they were rich. Amen? Another problem that they had, guys, was religion. Religion. Let me read you once again. It says, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So these Jewish people were people of religion, guys. So not only were they attacked through the secular setting, which was the people that had, you know, their companies that 
whether they fired them or they let them go because of their Christian. But even people within the church, the Jewish people within the church, they too persecuted. They too, whether made fun of them, they too mocked them. They too were receiving problems from within the church, guys. But I want you to know that God sees all these things, guys. He says, I know your works. I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. I know these Jewish people. I know the ones that are picking on you. I know. God is the one who's seen all things, guys. You hear what I'm saying? So check this out. After that, after he says, I see and I know these Jewish people, verse 10, he says, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days, but be faithful into death and I will give you the crown of life. So on top of their persecution, guys, and their poverty, they now, God was setting them up and saying, hey, some more stuff is coming. Now you're going to go into prison. But he says, do not fear. Do not fear. Now, I want, I want us to put ourselves in this place, guys. Look at guys. I don't know if we will ever experience what they've experienced. I don't know. Maybe. You know, we are living in, in crazy times, guys, that we're seeing crazy stuff. Things that are similar to, you know, maybe the mark, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that if you don't have the vaccine or you, this, I mean, those are similar things that, that I don't know. I don't know to what extent. And there's no doubt to be able to be persecuted or in poverty and then God to tell you, hey, and get ready because you're going to be put into prison. Now, I need you to understand this as well, because the prison of today is not like the prison of their time, guys. <laughs> the pri Some people like to go to prison because, hey, man, they get three meals a day. They get a little education there as well. You know, it's almost like a, a therapy. It's almost that we want to help. Sometimes it's, it's a system to try to help. Uh, some people go and, and they're going to spend five, six years and come out. Let me tell you something. You know, the prison from that time wasn't nothing like that. If you went to prison, the only reason you went to prison is because you were waiting um, to be either crucified or, or, or killed. You know, you're, you're going to be killed. That's, you're, that's just the waiting cell. So this is the reason why he says they're going to put you in prison. They're going to put you. But do not fear. Do not fear. Now, let me tell you, that's easy to say when you're not going through anything. And there's no superhuman. When you're in kind of a situation like that, you're going to fear, right? It's crazy. Like, oh, God, help me. But he says, don't fear. Get ready to stand up to whatever is going to come your way. Now, check this out, guys. You know, again, I'm not prophetic. I'm not saying this is the end time. But as Christians, guys, we got to be ready to stand up to whatever comes our way. No fear. No fear, he says. No fear. This is old school message right here, man. We haven't heard this in a long time. But you hear what I'm saying? No fear. Now check this out. This is where the intro of the message comes to play, guys. Because the way he introduced himself was a pretty amazing. He says, I am the first and the last. So I want you to grasp this and I want you to understand that. That no matter what happens in our life as Christians, he already knows. He has a plan. He is from the beginning to the end. And we're here. He knows all. The, he knows how we're going to go out. He's in control. He's the one who puts the pieces together. This is the reason why he can say, do not fear, because I'm the one moving the pieces together. I'm in control. Then he goes on to say that he's the, uh, the, the one who died and resurrected. He's, he's, he's to say that, hey, no matter what happens to you, even if you, be, if you get put to death, I have the power to resurrect your life. 
This is the reason why he's saying, do not fear the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of you and me, has all the power, guys. All the power. And we need to understand that. Now check this out. So when I say that he's in control, I need you to see it. He's the first and the last. I need you to see this. So he says, I'm going to put you in prison for 10 days. 10 days. Meaning it's a season. In other words, and, and, and it even says that the devil is the one who's going to put you in prison. In other words, the devil works for God. He's going to put you in prison. And yeah, he wants to kill you, but it's only going to be for 10 days. He is in control. He's in control. PowerPoint number two. Why? The, the, the purpose of the problem, number two. So, God, why do you allow us to go through all this, God? Why? Well, he says, you're going to be tested. It's a test, guys. It is a test. The reason why God allows us to go through all these problems that we go through. Again, we might never experience this. I don't know. But let me tell you, we've experienced some stuff in life, right? Sometimes even like if we were dying, man, like, oh, God, I can't take it no more. Am I the only one? Or do you agree? Or has it happened to you? Why does he allow all these problems to come our way? It's for a test, guys. He wants to polish us. He wants to, to make our faith, you know, uh, grow and look glorious. And I want to give you a scripture, guys. I'm almost done. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. I'm almost done. Look at what it says. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. And 7. It says, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been, you have been grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. For, so for a season, for a time, for 10 days, you're going to be put under the fire. But it's so that God's glory can come out of there. Your faith that is more precious than gold is going to be proven, guys. It's going to be made pure. It's going to be made holy in that. Only the genuine, the gold comes out after it's put under the fire. Yes? You hear what I'm saying, church? So look it, look it, look it. I, I, wanna, I want you to really grasp this. This is a church, guys. This is a church that God doesn't have any complaints about because it was put under the fire. Purity comes out when you place under the fire, guys. Whenever you're persecuted, whenever you're poor, you don't have no time for, for to be an Instagram any social media, you're not looking for a new house or a new car. When you're poor and when you're being persecuted, all you do is see God. I don't want to know nothing. I need God. I don't have anybody been in that kind of pain or situation. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying persecution or poverty. Maybe you experience, but I'm talking about pain, guys, that comes through problems. Where you don't even want to do, I don't want to do nothing. I need, I need to see God right now. I don't want to go to the store. I don't, I don't need nothing. I need God right now. Because everybody's happy and you're going through something hard in your life. When problems come our way, they create a purity in our life, guys. This is the refining of our faith. I start to believe God more than ever when I'm in my problem. That is what happened to this church. This church, there's no complaints about this church. There's no sin in this church because it is being put through the pressure, through the pain, through the fire. And they're coming out pure, man. A purity in the church. That doesn't seem so hot. You know? <laughs> not, not everybody's glad to hear this. I, I understand I understand that this is not a message that we're like, yes, all right, bring the problems. And I understand, but I, I, we go through problems. 
So whether you call on them or not, they're going to come your way, guys. Especially if you're a Christian. Especially if you want to do good. You start seeking. If you're not seeking God too much, you start seeking God. Get ready for some problems to come your way. The devil's coming after you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. But the more you push in towards God, the more you're going to see God's power. And the purity you're going to, it's going to become more pure. Your thoughts are going to change. You're going to be thinking like the way you used to think back then. Because there's purity in the pain of the problem. Amen? All right, guys. And we're done with, with this. So he says, for those who, who um, go through it all, let me just read it here. It says, do not fear, every, verse 10, do not fear of any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. That word crown, guys, uh, has two definitions in the Greek. One it speaks of a king's crown and the other one speaks of a crown of an athlete that has won the race, a reward given to him. And that's the crown that he's referring to here, guys. When we overcome our problems, the persecution, the poverty, the pressure, the pain of the problem, and we trust God and we stay with God, we get a reward, guys. A crown is given to us. A crown is given to us. Then he goes on to say, he who has an ear, once again, this is what we heard in Ephesians as well. He who has an ear... Uh, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be heard by the second death. This is important, guys. The second death represents hell, and it's the lake of fire. For those that are saved and those that overcome, guys, everything that will come our way, even if we were to die in this body, guys, we're going to live forever. We're not going to experience the second death. The second death is hell. The second death is the lake of fire, which belongs to those that don't give their life to Christ, that are not overcoming. If you're a Christian, you're an overcomer. Uh, and I want to declare that if you're a Christian, you're going to overcome. It's an automatic thing because Christians overcome. That's just the way it is. And therefore, we will not experience a second death. I know this is a little different, guys. This message is different. The study is different. But it's something that I believe we need to hear. God is coming. I feel that God is wanting me to speak on these seven churches. You know, and whatever God, you know, whatever you got tonight of application for you, maybe you're going through something even tonight. Push. Believe God. It's a season. It's 10 days. You're going to overcome. You're going to get your crown. You're not going to be uh, hurt by the second death. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Tonight.